Thank you so much, sincerely. This would be absolutely impossible without each and every one of you. I can't tell you how much it means to me. The music fades, the lights go down, a video plays, developers, apps, Apple, the community, we're all together again. And then, when the lights come back up, Tim Cook is walking onto the stage. Good morning! Good morning! And then we're gonna get it, Festivus in June, when Apple unwraps all the software presence, from iOS 13 to Mac OS 10.15, tvOS 13 to watchOS 6, and maybe, just maybe, get our first look at the all new, all modular Mac Pro and 6K Pro display. It's Apple's worldwide developer conference, and to help talk all of us through it, I called up one of the smartest developers on the planet, Guy Rambo of the Stack Trace podcast and 9to5Mac. Hit subscribe, Vader bomb the bell gizmo so you don't miss any of the WWC coverage I have coming your way, and then let's break it all down. I'm Rene Ritchie, and this is Vector. So I guess let's start off with iOS 13. Tim Cook hands off to Senior Vice President of Software Engineering, Craig Federighi, and he takes the stage to talk, um, let's say iPad specifics first. It feels like Apple is planned or unplanned on like this every other year cadence with the iPad specific updates. We got split view in iOS 9, drag and drop in iOS 11, and this year it sounds like an almost quote unquote finally buffet of multi-window, better file management, download manager for Safari, even maybe mouse support, and maybe an all new springboard design. Do you think we'll see all of that? Or, and do you think the implementation will make everyone who's been complaining so miserably about iPad Pro not fitting their vision of traditional computing uh, just complain a little bit less miserably? <laughs> well, it's certainly gonna help uh, because th these are quality of life features that people have been asking for for a long time, uh, myself included, like the download manager, if they pull that off, that will be great. Uh, currently, there's if you want to download a big file through Safari on iPad or even iPhone, it's kind of a pain, right? Or multiple files, God help you. <laughs> yes. So yeah, that, that, that by itself, it's going to be huge. And we still don't know in detail how the new uh, multitasking is going to work, how you're going to be able to have multiple quote-unquote windows of the yeah. same app. So uh, I'm sure that's going to help a lot. Yeah, there were rumors of tabs and there were rumors of swipe throughs. And I think the, the devil is in the implementation details. Yeah, definitely. And also how much work developers are going to have to put into this because if it's a lot of work, we can probably expect many developers to be a little behind on the implementation, as we know happens pretty much every year. You mean like Google? Yes, <laughs> Google, Google included. <laughs> uh, and mouse support, but maybe as an accessibility feature, which sounds almost like, OK, we need it, but we don't want you to know that we're admitting we need it, so we'll just put it in there. Yeah, yeah we have this cursor here, and you can use a mouse, but uh, don't talk about it too much. <laughs> we hid it under accessibility settings. No, it still reminds me of like, like Steve Jobs didn't want the arrow keys or the command line on the original Mac because he thought it would just mean that developers would only make uh, command line apps, and he wanted to force them to make GUI apps. But it's been like 11 years. I mean, people get multi-touch now. Yeah, definitely. And with um, these iPads with huge displays and the increasing support for external displays on iOS, I think it makes perfect sense. Because, I mean, you could, but you're, you're probably not going to want to use a 31 inch display <laughs> with, uh, with your fingers that that's not very ergonomic. So I think having mouse support can be a good thing. There are many people editing uh, audio and video and, yeah. and for those things, I think a cursor still works very well. Okay, so the more general stuff, I guess the more iPhone stuff, since that's by far the most popular endpoint, uh, dark mode, font management, a delete gesture, new Siri intents, human pose detection and AR, better taptics, direct photo and document capture, updatable Core ML models, combined Find My All The Things app. Uh, what do you think developers are going to care about? I mean, like the, the consumers, they're going to hear dark mode and they'll get like emoji ex level excited. But what do you think is going to appeal to developers? I think what's going to appeal to developers is changes that are going to be done to the backgrounding uh, features 
so we'll be able to do background tasks a little bit better because the background task model on iOS for developers has been the, pretty much the same since they introduced backgrounding, which was what <laughs> iOS 6. Uh, so I think that that definitely needs uh, some improvements there. I've been advocating for uh, a headless extension type of uh, extension yeah. that developers can write that because we do have extensions for things such as notifications and Siri and stuff like that, but we don't have, I want to do this little piece of work in the background, but I, currently if you want to do that, you have to bootstrap your entire app yeah. in the background. And and that that's kind of weird and, and causes many bugs. And, and it, it's even worse for, for performance because you have to bootstrap things that usually appear on screen, but they're not appearing on screen. So you're consuming memory and resources that are not needed. So I, I definitely feel like that's going to be a big thing. And also the improvements to machine learning, which you'll be able to train models on device. Yeah. That's going to be a biggie. And the uh, improvements also to the Siri Intense API that I'm not sure about that, but hopefully we'll be able to get more input from Siri because currently you can only get input if you're doing things such as messaging that's a predefined domain. But if I have an app that has a custom intent, I can't get any input. The user has to perform the action beforehand, save it as a shortcut, and then I get the same input every time. But I want to have different input. And I think just if there's a Siri intent finally for media, then anybody who uses like Spotify or Overcast or Audible or Netflix will just, they'll be so happy they can finally just say, play what I want and it'll work. Yeah, and it, it's interesting to, I'm very curious to see how that's going to be implemented, how that's going to work in practice, because uh, as I talked about before, uh, media is complicated because yeah. the assistant has to understand what you're saying and names of songs and artists they are not words uh, they are names and there there has to be a domain in there that that knows how to interpret this stuff and there's music on spotify that's not on apple music so how does spotify tell siri which music it can play that that's very interesting i'm curious to see what's going to be done there. Okay, so Tim gives us a quick recap of TV Plus, and then maybe Eddie Q, Senior Vice President of Services, or someone from the Apple TV team hits the stage um, for TVOS 13. I mean, we, it never seems to get that much stage time, at least, or as many features as Apple's other operating systems. And previously, what it has gotten has been focused almost exclusively on the TV app. But Apple just already updated the TV app in March. Uh, and I guess they launched it in May. So do you think we should have fewer, if any, expectations this year? I'd love to see Apple-branded game controllers or some kind of licensed controller game bundles and maybe keyboard gaming support. Um, TV app for Android, smart TVs, a anything? Well, I think uh, one aspect of tvOS that could be improved significantly would be uh, the support for handoff. Yeah, I, I would love to be able to uh, transfer playback between devices a lot more easily. Uh, it's very common for me to start watching something like a, a vector video on YouTube <laughs> on, on my iPad. And then I, I want to transition to, to my living room. And currently, I mean, it's not that hard. I, I pause the video on my iPad and I pick it up on, on the Apple TV, but I have to go to history and find yeah. the video. And sometimes it doesn't register the playback position. So I I would love to be able to just say, start playing this on my TV now without using AirPlay. I wanted to launch the YouTube app yeah. and play it there. So yeah, I would love to have that. And we heard some, some rumors about improved multi-user support. I mean, improved, I mean, yeah. actual multi-user multi support, support. <laughs> which we don't have. So uh, maybe that would come to the uh, Apple TV as well. That would be a really good place to have it because it's a shared device. Next up, Tim Cook introduces Kevin Lynch, Vice President of Watch Software, but he doesn't walk out. Tim looks confused, but then Kevin transporters right onto center stage with that special app he showed off last fall. Possible? I think that's for WatchOS 7. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 
uh, it sounds like this is an app happy update. Long missing apps like calculator and voice memos, but still maybe not notes. Apple books for audiobooks, bedtime for clock, a pill reminder and a cycle tracking app, but also App Store Live and on device. That'll be super convenient for users, but will it make a big difference for devs? Or, or like we're gonna talk about in just a minute with UIKit apps coming to the Mac, what about UIKit apps coming to the watch? I think that's a big improvement. These days, if you want, let's say I have an idea for uh, a watch app that's just, it only makes sense on the Apple Watch, I have to make an iOS app. I, yeah. I, I can't just make a watch OS app. Uh, and um, it, we already have this for the messages app. So if I want to, to make a messages only app, I can do that. And it is still within an iOS app proper, yeah. but that app is hidden away and it doesn't uh, appear anywhere. So. Uh, I'm not sure if that's what they're doing for the watchOS stuff. It's it's going to change the, the development for the watch significantly if you can have these two types of apps. The one type that's just a watch app that the user installs through their Apple Watch and the other that's an iOS app with a, a watchOS extension. So I'm very interested in seeing exactly what that's going to do to watchOS development. I think that can be a sign that, that things are going to be changing a lot more for watchOS developers. I remember back with iOS 5, we got iCloud and we got PC free. And finally, you didn't need iTunes to have an iPhone. And I know onboard App Store is just one step, but it kind of feels like we're getting a little bit closer to iPhone free when you don't mess, maybe you won't, won't need an Apple Watch. I swear you won't need an iPhone to have an Apple Watch. But is there anything else you'd need, like direct sign-in on the watch to your accounts or uh, remote restore, anything else you'd look for there? Yeah, I mean, uh, th that's a big uh, thing with the Apple Watch. So uh, let's say um, I want to use my favorite uh, Reddit app on, on the Apple Watch, let let's say Apollo, yeah. and they want to make just a watch app. And how do I log in to, to, to Reddit? So they did something for that with the introduction of WebKit, Safari, basically, so you can have the OAuth screen show up, but those are not optimized for the yeah. Apple Watch, so it's not the, a great experience. But I've, I've heard some, some rumors about improved text input on the Apple Watch, which could, uh, I'm not sure how that's going to work, but I mean, they have clever people there. I, I'm sure they can figure something out, and it's never going to be as convenient uh, or as easy as using your phone. But if you're outside and you're using your LTE-enabled Apple Watch and you don't have your phone, just being able to have something right then and there without having to have your phone nearby. All right, so there are also uh, you know, more complications, new watch faces, but no word on custom faces yet or always on low power faces. I'm not sold on the former. I keep saying like, just give me the photos face with unlimited complications options and I can make any custom face I want pretty much. But I'd really like to see that low power face, but it still feels like they're spending energy budget on apps and on, on communications and other features. Do you think Apple would do either of those? I mean, there's, uh, I know there's been some uh, considerable refactoring done uh, in uh, the uh, main screen of the Apple Watch. So basically refactoring, for those who don't know, basically changing code without necessarily changing functionality. <laughs> um, they basically split the clock face from what's the home screen in the Apple Watch the grid of icons or the list yeah. of icons, those have been split into two separate things. Uh, so maybe that could be because they want to support better low power watch faces. Uh, that could be a reason for this change, but that doesn't mean this change is coming this year. It could be next year. Okay, Craig is back and that means the Mac. So you and I have talked about Marzipan or UI kit apps for the Mac for a couple of times already. Last year it was a few kind of terrible Apple made sample apps. This year it's supposed to be a whole new or a whole more matured Marzipan for developers in beta. I know that delights Steve Trott and Smith and rankles some traditional Mac developers immensely, but how are you thinking about it now? Yeah, I think the developer experience there is gonna be the best it can be. Uh, just check a, a box in Xcode and you can run your iOS app on Flip the Mac. A bit. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. For, for most apps, it's gonna be easy. 
it depends on the complexity of the app, of course. Uh, some apps don't make sense at all on the Mac. Some make more sense than others. But what we are going to see this year is, is them bringing some features that are going to be used as well on the iPad, like the multi-window stuff. And that's going to be supported on the Mac as well. So you'll be able to have Marzipan apps that have multiple windows, which currently you can't. Uh, they are these uh, contained window, yeah. iOS apps within a Mac window, kind of like the iOS simulator. <laughs> um, I actually have this uh, problem uh, many times. I, I I launch a Marzipan app and I try dragging with the mouse. Yeah, to yeah. How you do it on the simulator. <laughs> My brain is still confused. Uh, <laughs> So we'll see that, and uh, obviously dark mode support. So Mac has dark mode, iOS will have dark mode. If you run an app that supports dark mode, it's going to switch, even if it's a Marzipan app. We might see some uh, controls from iOS that have been have had their visuals changed a little bit to be more Mac-like. Not not that you're going to look at the UI and say it's a Mac app, but a little bit better than than currently. Do you think that you'll look at them and say, because this is my thing, like some people just think they're gonna look at them and they'll look wrong. And I guess the best hope is that you'll look at them and you'll think this is the next generation of Mac app. Yeah, I think that that's the goal. And, um, but I think what, what users are going to see and think is that this is different, that this is a little bit different, but I don't think for most people, it's going to be a problem to have these apps that are different. It might be good for them because they have the app that's basically the same on, on all of their devices. If they use a Mac, an iPhone, an iPad, it's going to look similar. And it, it's all going to depend on how much work the developer is willing to put in because we'll be able to have things such as touch bar support, a menu, a, a real Mac menu in the menu bar. We'll be able to have keyboard shortcuts. We'll be able to have a Mac toolbar for apps. So if the developer is willing to do a little bit extra work to be a better Mac citizen, uh, I, I think that's going to benefit everyone. Also on the docket, a new non-Marzipan music app, Siri shortcuts for Mac, iMessage effects, screen time for Mac, family sharing and first class authentication citizenship for Apple Watch, something much closer akin to what Touch ID can already do, better window management, uh, and that sounds like a lot of catch up to iOS, which I guess fair enough because iOS in many ways is still catching up with the Mac. But I can't help but think that people who really love the Mac would really love to see more features specific to the Mac, especially since it feels like Apple is once again getting serious about Mac hardware. Um, what do you think? I think the uh, Mac operating system has been stable for, for a long time. So for me, what I need from, from my Mac is that it is stable <laughs> and reliable. Uh, and I think they should definitely focus on that since this is where uh, at least my work happens as a developer. It might change in the future. We don't know, but it's still the, the main workhorse of, of the uh, Mac development and iOS development community. So I think they should definitely focus on keeping it as a stable platform and still moving it forward for users, whether that means improving the OS itself or bringing more stuff from iOS. Now, oftentimes, WWC is a software-only show, but it has been used to launch a ton of hardware over the years as well. Now, we just got a spec bump for the MacBook Pro and the iMacs before that. Nothing for MacBook Air or Mac Mini yet, but those were updated in October, so probably not. iMac Pro and the 12-inch MacBook Pro, though, I've been waiting for a while. But back in 2013, we got a preview of the Trash Can Mac Pro. In 2017, we got a preview of the iMac Pro. Apple's already said they're working on a new modular Mac Pro with Pro Display. How do you peg the odds we'll see Phil Schiller, Senior Vice President of Worldwide Marketing, or John Ternus, Vice President of Hardware Engineering, uh, you know, show up and give us a preview of that, this WWDC? Uh, so I think uh, it's pretty safe to assume that the new Mac Pro will be previewed and also this new external display. And what would you like to see from it? Because when people hear the word modular, some people think, cool, I'll be able to plug in extensions. And other people think, oh my God, no, there's going to be some goofy proprietary Lego block that I build this thing out of. Do you have any hopes or fears? I mean, I'm with the group that would like to 
just have a Mac tower that you a can cheese grater. <laughs> yeah, swap RAM, swap processor, swap GPUs, swap whatever. So I think when they say modular, they should do that. It could have a really cool industrial design, uh, maybe kind of like the, the cube where you can just press a thing and it pops out and you can swap stuff. Uh, so that's what I think of as modular. It has extra slots for me to add more SSD if I need to and more yeah. GPU. So I hope that's what they mean by modular. Guy, always such a pleasure. Thank you again for joining me. Thanks, Arza. Pleasure to be here and looking forward uh, to meeting you at WebDub. Ah, absolutely. And you can find Guy on the Stack Trace podcast. You can read his work on 9to5Mac. You can reach him on Twitter at underscore inside. He's one of the best developers in the world. And if that's something that interests you, a great place to start is Brilliant. Brilliant offers dozens of interactive courses, including ones on algorithms and machine learning that you can explore on your commute while traveling or just about anywhere, even offline. Download any of their dozens of interactive courses through the mobile app and you'll be able to solve fascinating problems in math, science, and computer science, no matter where you are or how spotty your connection is. What's awesome about these courses is that they're totally interactive. Just check out this one on using logic to eliminate possibilities and look for symmetry that can significantly reduce the number of options in a problem. It's full of balloons and presents. Who doesn't love balloons and presents? So if you want to support Vector and get unlimited access to all of Brilliant's in-depth math and science courses, you can head on over to brilliant.org slash vector to get 20% off their annual premium subscription. Thanks, Brilliant, and thanks to all of you. So maybe that's how some of this goes down. Maybe not. Either way, we'll only know for sure when the keynote kicks off on June 3rd at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern in San Jose, California. But that's just the beginning. Right after the main keynote is the developer keynote, State of the Union. Then, traditionally, the Apple Design Awards. And that's still only Monday. Developer and designer sessions and special events run from Tuesday through Friday, and you can track them all in the just updated WWDC app, which is once again outstanding work by the Evangelist team each year, every year, and certainly this year. And again, I'll be there all week bringing you back everything I possibly can. So hit like, hit subscribe so you don't miss out, and then hit up the comments below and let me know what you want to see at WWDC. Thank you so much for watching and see you next video.